Ladies and gentlemen, you know we have a special guest here today. He was kind enough to accept our invitation for the first time on an Italian Drupal event. We have the chance to talk with the, the creator himself, Dries. Uh, Dries is the original creator. Sorry. <laughs> Dries is the original creator and project lead of Drupal, the open source web platform used by 2% of the world's website with over 35 active, 35 thousand active contributors around the world and one of the largest, most active and most innovative open source projects in the world. Dries have been working on Drupal for 20 years and Dries co-founded Acquia in 2007 and today is Acquia's chief technology officer and also runs product strategy, product management, user experience and product marketing. So we have many things to talk about. Please welcome on stage Dries. Awesome. Hey. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. <laughs> buongiorno, buongiorno, Dries. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice How to are meet you? you as well. Good, good. Feeling very good. Thanks for having me today. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dries. You were very kind. So, uh, Dries, first of all, uh, I know you love Italy and you even got married in, in Tuscany, right? So, so what do you think of our, of our country? <laughs> I mean, I, I love it. That's why, we, um, that's why we got married in Italy. I got married in Italy a few years ago now. Uh, actually, and uh, recently went back to Italy this summer, actually, just a couple of months ago, and that was our honeymoon. So we we wanted to oh. go on our honeymoon after getting married, but uh, obviously COVID happened and it wasn't that easy to travel. And so we postponed um, yeah, we postponed our, our honeymoon for a couple of years. And finally, I uh, came back to Italy uh, just a couple of months ago and we um, we toured around the north of Italy, I would say, from the Dolomiti all the way to Tuscany. So everything above Rome, I would say, uh, we visited. So it was, it was really nice. Cool. Um, so, you know, I have a special question for you. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, I must ask this question. It's, it's about pronunciation. Of course. Okay. So Because Dries is easy, but your mm -hmm. last name is always a challenge. So oh. can you please help me? Yeah, is there, sure. is, there, is there like a trick to remember it? I don't know, but I'll, I'll pronounce it first. By the way, my first name, um, Dries, is actually, I'm curious what it would be in Italian because it actually comes from Andreas. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in English, for example, you have Andrew and Drew. And Dries oh, okay. is like Drew. So I don't know if there's an Italian version of Andrew, Andrea, or Drea. Andrea. Maybe. Andrea. So I guess my yes. Italian name would be Drea, I guess. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, but I'll let you guys figure that out. Oh, you're obviously. <laughs> okay. No, we, we don't have, we, we just have Andrea. Andrea. Okay. You don't have yes. the short version. No, no. Uh, okay. Yeah. In Dutch and in English, you have the short version of Andrew and Andries. Andries. Anyhow, my last name is pronounced Bertart. Bertart. Okay. Um, okay. To the Bartart. best of my Bartart, yes, it's very good. To the to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm not sure how to remember it uh, if you're Italian speaking, but um, yeah, Bartart. Most people don't pronounce my last name. You know, they just call me Dries, and that's fine. <laughs> okay, okay, that's easy. Cool, okay. thank you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we had a wonderful DrupalCon some days ago. Mm -hmm. So, what can you say about it? What, what, what are your feelings? What did you left you with? Um, I thought it was great. Um, we had about uh, over 1,200 people, which was actually very good. Uh, it was a large audience and it felt really good to be together uh, again in person, you know, after so many years. Uh, obviously, we had DrupalCon in uh, Portland, uh, in the United States earlier this year as well. And that felt really good. Um, but it felt so nice to be together in Prague. And, you know, I felt there was great energy. You know, people were excited about Drupal and the future of Drupal. And yeah, it just felt really good. Um, I'm curious what people think, you know, but um, yeah. that's how I felt. Yeah, if someone uh, here in the chat uh... Uh, went to the DrupalCon in Prague, uh, maybe can ask questions. And by the way, uh, now we'll ask you questions that we collected a few days ago. Uh, most mm -hmm. of them come, uh, came from, uh, from our audience or from, uh, uh, from within our community. 
and so I will uh, I, I will share them with you. But uh, uh, in the meantime, if uh, some question comes up from 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 the chat, maybe I can I can just uh, uh, ask uh, ask you. So so chat, please be be so make make some noise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and if so you have a question, start... I'm reading the chat, so I can read it. By the way. Um... Feel free oh, okay. to ask you can me from it. the chat, but like if people want to ask it in English in chat, that's helpful too, because I'm okay. still working on yeah. my Italian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the, the only problem is that we have a little delay uh, between the streaming okay. and the chat, so maybe. Okay. But if you if you can see it, uh, we we also can can collect it. Okay. Uh, Perfect. I, I think. Um, so let's start with uh, with uh, with the, this question. Um, what is the roadmap for moving from profiles? by installing a single profile, which cannot be replaced later, to distribution recipes like Symfony Flex? Yeah, it's a good question. So might be useful to explain that a little bit. So today in Drupal for a long time, we have had this concept of distributions, uh, which is basically a version of Drupal. So take Drupal core, the base platform, you add modules to it, you add some configuration to it, and you have a distribution. And today we have maybe a thousand plus distributions uh, on Drupal.org. Uh, Well-known distributions are things like open social um, for like intranets and community kind of sites. We have distributions for using Drupal as an e-learning platform. We have all kinds of distributions. Uh, and they're actually very nice, you know, often they're pretty, pretty awesome. Um, but earlier this year, we launched an initiative to evolve distribution, a distribution and a concept of distributions to to something that we, that I initially, I called it uh, site starter templates, I think. <laughs> and we have since renamed it to recipes. So you may have heard about recipes or you may have heard about site starter templates, but they're basically the same. Um, but the idea is how can we package modules and configurations in a slightly different way with the goal to overcome some of the limitations that distributions have. And particularly the challenge with a distribution is once you pick a distribution and you start with it, um, you can't really add another distribution on top of it, for example, right? Like uh, an example could be, um, say you want to start a blog, uh, you can start with a blogging distribution, but let's say your blog takes off and now you want to sell some t-shirts <laughs> on your site as well. You can't <laughs> then install commerce kickstart on top of your blog. You know what I mean? So that's a, that's a bit of a challenge. And so the idea with recipes is that you could install the blogging recipe that gives you everything you need for a blog, but then later you could still install the e-commerce recipe. And so they're kind of stackable or combinable and you can mix and match distribution. So there are a slightly different granularity. Um, it's something that we started earlier this year and we don't have a solid roadmap yet. So far we've spent uh, our time and it's this is being led by Alex Potts, one of the core contributors, core committers. Uh, is um, working on collecting use cases and figuring out the basic architecture. And they've only just started, um, you know, maybe writing some code. So we're early in the journey of recipes or trying to get a good understanding of what to do. And by the way, Alex Potts, um, one of the things that he does, he works for an organization called Thunder. And you may have heard about Thunder as well, but there is a distribution called Thunder, which is, uh, a distribution for magazine websites, um, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so anyway, so he has a, 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 a he has a lot of background with distributions, and he's trying to move this forward. So, but the goal is to uh, evolve the recipes idea and then ship Drupal with recipes out of the box. Um, some some of the technical roadmap is that we actually just want to leverage Composer for this. So we don't necessarily, like today, a distribution, it's a lot of code, <laughs> um, but we can leverage Composer to make a distribution, almost like a Composer file, plus some configuration, plus maybe a small module uh, or something along those along those ways. So the other advantage of that is that um, when you 
today when you build a distribution, it's a lot of maintenance work for the person that maintains the distribution. But with the recipes idea and by leveraging Composer, uh, it wouldn't be as much as a burden because we would just rely on Composer to help you manage the updates of your recipes. And anyway, hopefully that gives a little bit of insight in what we're doing. I wish we had a clearer timeline and roadmap, but we don't today, not yet. Okay, uh, there's a question from the chat that I can pick from, from Marco. Um, do you think it will be possible to push upstream upgrades like config upgrades with distribution recipes? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't know the answer yet. We're, you know, I think uh, all, all of these things we should explore and consider. I think uh, it's a good idea. Uh, personally, <laughs> um, but I would say get involved. You know, Marco, if you have if you have great ideas, you may have experience with this as well. Um, please do get invo involved. Now is a great time to get involved because we're literally trying to shape what it is. And, and maybe Marco is already involved. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, config upgrades would be would be awesome to have. Obviously, it's a big part of making it easy to use and seamless for people. Okay. Um, I have another question, but uh, it's regarding Drush. So do you coordinate with Drush for initiatives like automatic updates? Um, we might. Um, I mean, we do everything in the open. So these initiatives, they can get involved, I would say. Um, we're trying to build everything using good APIs too. Like we're, you know, automatic updates, we're actually building it on top of something that we call our package manager, um, which is basically a framework that can execute composer commands. So I imagine Drush could leverage that as well. I, I don't know if they do. I mean, the package manager is relatively new and still being developed. So uh, I think ideally we would all use the same underlying technology. That's what we're trying to do at least uh, because for example, project browser also uses the package manager. So it would make sense for Drush to to use the package manager as well, right? Because then we're all using and testing uh, and hardening the same kind of underlying building blocks. Okay, um, let's change topic. Um, we're talking about privacy and data protection here. Mm -hmm. So uh, during last DrupalCon, you mentioned the open web and how Drupal will let companies handle their own data. What about the single site users? Do you think the future, in the future, we can guarantee Drupal site users to own their own data and how? Yeah, I think we can guarantee that they own their own data. Um, I mean, the how is just Drupal is open source, right? So <laughs> because Drupal is open source, you own the code. It's your code, if you will. And that means you can do with it whatever you want. And so if you want to own your own data, uh, that would be your choice. Like, And that's, for example, why I use Drupal for my personal sites. And I talked about that actually at DrupalCon. Um, but um, I opened my keynote at DrupalCon kind of talking about sort of the personal reasons why I use Drupal as an individual user with a relatively small site. Um, and for example, I at what I talked about is that after all these years, I continue to upload photos to my blog. And I asked myself the question, why do I keep doing that? You know, why don't I just move everything to Instagram or Flickr or some other photo service? And I answered it for three reasons. Basically, one, my photos, my data is very precious to me. You know, I, I don't have the greatest memory. <laughs> and so photos help me memor you know, memorize uh, experiences, like maybe my trips to Italy. And so too often I see these hosted services, whether it's MySpace or Facebook or these kinds of, you know, services lose data or and sometimes even completely go out of business, you know, and I don't like that. And that's why I upload photos to my own sites because I want to be in control of my own data. And so uh, that's just one of the reasons why I use Drupal for my own small personal site. But um, because Drupal is open source, you are in charge. You know, you can choose your own destiny as it relates to your data, but also as it relates to everything else, like how you make your site look and feel, 
how accessible your site is, how everything, you know, where you host it, <laughs> you can choose everything. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I see a couple of questions from the chat. But, um, I, I will start with Luca because Luca is talking about uh, uh, pre 2000 uh, front end mm -hmm. web designer. And uh, I, I think he's complaining about uh, having to use Composer uh, to install <laughs> modules. Uh, so what do you mm -hmm. think about? Uh, because I, I, think, I think we have this trend like uh, uh, now new developers now are more, um, are more a lot of the, on, the, on the gem stack, okay, uh, on front ends and micro front ends, but all developers like myself, for example, or, or Luca here, uh, are with uh, with PHP CMS. Um, so, what do you think? Uh, uh, I, I think we can we can uh, turn this question in something about the evolution of Drupal from the uh, early ver earlier versions to to the new web with uh, mm -hmm. with the decoupled uh, front ends uh, and and micro front ends. So, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> uh, first of all, I think. Just to answer Lucas' question directly, like, yes, the goal of Project Browser is to enable people like Luca and, and everybody else to install modules without having to use the command line. Now, Project Browser under the hood will use Composer, right? Composer does a lot of important things, like it will download um, basically a module from the right source. It will also manage dependencies because one module might require another module. Composer figures that out for you. It will also manage compatibility, like maybe one version of a module requires a very specific version of another module because they're not compatible otherwise. So Composer will manage a lot of complexity um, and, and so we will use Composer under the hood, but the user experience with the project browser is that you can find modules easily and you can just hit an install button and Composer and, and project browser will do the rest. And the goal is to specifically make it easy for people to, you know, to install modules and you combine that with the automatic updates initiative. We can talk about that as well, but then that will automatically update modules for you. So again, you don't have to use Composer to update modules. Now, if you are an expert user um, that likes to use Composer on the command line, perfect, you can do that too. <laughs> we're not taking anything away um, for expert users. We're just building a layer on top of Composer um, that makes Drupal more accessible to um, those people and organizations that prefer to use a UI versus a command line. So I, I forgot your follow-up question. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, I, I, no, no I, I was talking about uh, the, the new web trend. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, now there are lots of talks about uh, front-ends, micro-front-ends, decoupled architectures. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, I mean, the question is, uh, do you think the future of Drupal is like only as a backend CMS or uh, or the front end of Drupal still has uh, room to yeah. evolve. I personally think the future will you will need both. So the way I look at um, the current situation is like you have sort of traditional Drupal where the front end is coupled to a Drupal, right? And you have headless approaches where Drupal can be a content platform, a content backend, and you push or pull content into, let's say, a JavaScript uh, frontend, whether it's React, Vue, Svelte, you name it. I think those are two very different approaches to building a website, and both have their own pros and cons. But at the highest level, developers like using uh, Drupal in headless mode with a JavaScript framework. Um, and that makes sense, that's fine. <laughs> the problem with that is that often it's at the, at the cost of the marketer or the content creator. The non-developer suffers because they lose a lot of capabilities. Now they're dependent on developers to make changes to the website. 
right? So they often lose things like previews um, or the ability to build layouts easily uh, or the ability to actually create a landing page in five minutes without having to uh, consult a developer or the ability to change a menu item or the ability to, you know, all sorts of things marketers lose. So it's great for developers. It's not always good for marketers and vice versa. Uh, the traditional approach marketers tend to love and developers may not always love it now so it's important to understand there's pros and cons and very often i see agencies and developers push for the headless approach when it's actually not in the best interest of the customer uh, sometimes it is in the best interest of the customer but i don't always feel like people weigh the pros and cons carefully now when I look at large organizations, um, many of them have many websites. Uh, and each website or many of these websites tend to be very different. You know, some websites are small. Some websites are very large. Some websites are simple. Some websites are very complex. Some websites are owned by developers. Some websites are owned by marketers. <laughs> some websites are temporary, you throw them away after two months, uh, like maybe the website for this event. <laughs> the event is over at some point, the website doesn't make sense anymore. Other websites you have for 20, 30 years. And because all these websites are so different, organizations really need to mix and match different approaches, right? For the small throwaway website, yeah, maybe you wanna use something very quick and easy that a marketer can put together maybe for your main website, where you wanna do a lot of custom features, maybe headless and a JavaScript front end makes sense, or maybe it's the other way around. But my point is, I see organizations combine different things. They want traditional, they want headless. And then in Drupal, we also have a hybrid version, right? Where you can combine these two uh, approaches. You can create some pages with traditional Drupal, and then you can still expose content using you know json api or graphql at the same time <laughs> or you can you can generate the base page with drupal and then use javascript to add interactivity to it so i think the strength of drupal is that it does all of these things and that you can standardize on it and that you can carefully decide which approach is better for the end user of the site uh, so Anyway, it's a long answer. <laughs> to a no, no, it's, question, it's, it's but perfect. I, I hope it's it perfect. Makes and, sense, and, you know? and also, I'm I'm smiling because uh, mm -hmm. you know I had and 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 all of us had lots of experiences with what you with what you said. So yeah. uh, it's really I I, I can't relate. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I think I, I, maybe to add one more thing, I think these worlds are coming together a little bit. Like the pure headless CMSs maybe the contentfuls and the content stacks of the world, they're going to figure out how to add features that Drupal already does <laughs> that are gonna bring marketers into their platform. You know, So they're gonna come yeah. up with layout building, they're gonna come up with previews, they're gonna come up with all the things. And the end result is <laughs> that they'll look more and more like a traditional CMS. And at the same time, Drupal uh, obviously, we added a lot of headless capability, so we already look a little bit like a headless CMS too. But I think these two worlds will somehow converge a little, you know, not perfectly, but I think right now they might be very different. But in the future, I have to believe they will, you know, yeah. will come closer together. So, um, I think I can link to this with the, with a question from the chat from a, a user with no name. Uh, this let, let's do an imagination exercise drupal in five or ten years from now mm -hmm. uh, what do you think it would look like that's a great question um and the way i answer that question is actually take uh, inspiration from uh, jeff bezos uh the founder of amazon and he asked he was asked in an interview i guess just like this <laughs> what what does the future of amazon look like in 10 years and jeff bezos answered it it's actually the wrong kind of question to ask. <laughs> uh, the right question to ask is what will not change in the next 10 years? And you should invest in what 
is not going to change because you know that that investment is going to be in good investment, you know? And in the case of Amazon, he said, well, I know people want faster shipping. They're going to want, they want that today. They want that in five years. They want faster shipping in 10 years and they'll want faster shipping in 20 years, <laughs> just as an example. And so it makes sense to invest billions and billions of dollars into making shipping faster. And so if you answer the question the same way for Drupal, what does Drupal, what will Drupal look like in 10 years? You could say, well, what, what is not going to change? And there's a few things, I think. One, we know organizations will have more and more content. Nobody's going to have less content. <laughs> so they're always ever going to need to manage content and, and probably 10 times more content. So we should invest in sort of Drupal as a content platform uh, and scaling Drupal as a content platform too. We know organizations are going to have more websites, more applications, right? And so we need to think about how do we help organizations manage more and more different applications? Um, because if you go back 20 years, organizations have maybe one website, maybe two websites, but today, even small organizations have 10, 20, 30 websites for everything that they do. Um, Three, we know there's going to be more channels. Like, again, 10 years ago, you had web and maybe mobile. Now you have obviously mobile, you know, native mobile, I should say. You have web, but there's also chat, uh, audio with voice assistance. You, you have AR, VR, maybe the metaverse. Who knows? <laughs> so we, we know we're going to have more channels. So we know we need to invest in making our content ready for sending it to different kinds of channels, not just HTML, right, for websites, but to other kinds of channels that may require JSON or XML or who knows what's going to be next. So if I, if I and, and we know security will be more and more important too, because security and compliance is, is only growing in importance. So these are kind of three, four, five things that we know are going to be true today, that, because they're, they were true 10 years ago. They're more true today, and they'll be even more true <laughs> 10 years from now. So what, what, what all of that means is we need to invest in, in Drupal's core content management capabilities, you know, inputting content, managing content, defining content models, and sending that content to different places. We also know that no code is a big trend. And this is interesting because it goes back to headless too. Like if you think yep. about the last 20 years of the web, the web was born. We had something called webmasters <laughs> and webmasters wrote HTML by hand and then used FTP to upload it to a server, you know, and then yeah. content management systems replaced the traditional webmaster role <laughs> and they enabled, we enabled less technical people to create web pages. Right, you didn't know have to know HTML that much, and you didn't have to use FTP. You could just use your browser, uh, and so enabling sort of less technical people to build websites and build experiences using WYSIWYG and drag and drop, which is all the things that we call no code and low code, is a twenty it, a twenty year trend. It's a multi multi-decade trends <laughs> and it's going to be true 10 years from now and so it's interesting to see sort of the fragmentation that exists a little bit today with with headless and, and jamstack and, and kind of these very developer-centric approaches because there is still this uber trend you know this mega trend that has existed for over 20 years to make web publishing website building more democratized to bring in marketers, content creators, business people in the process of creating experiences on the web. And I think that's going to grow. I don't think headless is going to change that, you know? Uh, and yeah. so we need to figure out how to make Drupal easy to use for a very large uh, segment of the market while also doing headless. I don't think they're necessarily exclusive, but um, anyway, th these are some of my thoughts on the future. So these are more trends than specifics, I guess, but that's how I think about it. 
no, no, it's uh, I think it's a great answer. And let me also add the the the, the accessibility part mm -hmm. uh, because I think Drupal did a wonderful job uh, in accessibility. Uh, also with the latest uh, default theme in Drupal, Olivero, uh, with a great look and accessibility. So, of course, this is not a trend. This is something that uh, should always be uh, a foundation from for yes. for, for every for every uh, web website. project. But yeah, yes. but I think Drupal did a great job. Um, yeah, I feel very passionate about that, um, and and we made a, a commitment. Drupal made a commitment to to improve accessibility. And I, th I think sometimes people wonder like why, because, you know, uh, most people don't need it, right? Yeah. Um, but I do think it's very important because the web is ingrained in our daily lives in everything that we do. Obviously we use it for fun to watch videos, to, you know, for fun, but we also use it for work. Um, we use it to socialize. We use it to pay our bills. We often use it to manage like healthcare related things too. And so as more transactions, more collaboration, more interactions, all of that is moving to the web. And I feel like because of that, there is a greater responsibility to ensure that the web is inclusive of every person um, and that it accounts for everybody's safety not just accessible, that, but that we make Drupal safe in the sense like it's secure, <laughs> like you don't are not going to get hacked, uh, those kinds of things. And and when we exclude people from being able to access online experiences um, today, that means they're also excluded from rewarding careers, from maybe independent lifestyles from social interactions, from friendships, right? Um, all yeah. of this happens on the web now. And so when people ask, why do we do it? That's why we do it, you know, because we want everybody to experience all these great things about the web. And we want also these people, pe visually impaired people, for example, to help us build Drupal. You know, if, if they're not able to use Drupal, they're also not gonna contribute to Drupal or a lot less likely to contribute to Drupal. And we need people with disabilities to be contributors because that's how we're gonna make the software better for people like them. You know, it helps to have um, a very diverse community with very diverse people because that's how we're gonna build the best software. Yeah. Um, let me talk about uh, the cloud. Cloud, uh, cloud native. Okay, so we have a question from Marcello in the chat. So Dries, uh, do you have any advice for building and running infrastructure for Drupal, especially in a cloud environment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, <laughs> um, as as, you as was mentioned in the introduction, I started a, a company called Acquia uh, 15, 16 years ago, and our core business is to run Drupal in the cloud. So. I've, you know, obviously spend a lot of my career working on Drupal itself, but I've also spent 15 years of my life building, um, you know, cloud hosting infrastructure. And, and Acquia built everything on AWS, by the way. When, when Acquia launched, AWS actually also <laughs> launched, Amazon Web Services also launched, and we, we bet the whole company on, on AWS. And so we built a very scalable cloud hosting solution on AWS and, and we run some of the largest websites in the world. Um, like we, we just ran the, the website for the Olympics, um, which, you know, gets hundreds of millions or billions of views. Like it's the largest event in the world. It's the largest digital event in the world, you yeah. know, the Olympics. And so I have a lot of thoughts on how to build scalable, um, cloud hosting using, you know, Amazon or Google Cloud or Azure even. Um, I mean, I, I think I think the beauty of these platforms is that you can build scalable solutions. You know, they allow you to to do things like dynamic scalability, where you can use a little bit of infrastructure when you have a little bit of traffic and then dynamically scale the infrastructure 
when traffic grows and then scale down again, uh, all of these things. Um, so it is possible, I will say, um, that a lot of organizations try to build that themselves, which you can, um, but I think it's hard to, to do that effectively uh, and have something that's as good as, let's say, an Acquia Clouds, because, you know, to put things in perspective, we have 300, I think, full-time engineers working on our cloud solution, you know? And, and they work on it every day with 300 people <laughs> to build the best scalable Drupal cloud hosting solution. So there's a lot of things that go into that from security to the compliance, to developer tools, um, like development and staging environments to CI CD pipelines to, to do continuous integration. So a lot of things I think that you are, you know, organizations are customers need and you can build those things yourself for sure. But um, probably never going to be as in depth as 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 going with a dedicated organization. And there's others like you know Pantheon and Platform and, and and companies like that that specialize in doing those things for Drupal. Yeah, um, and uh, always talking about cloud-based services. Uh, there's another question from Paolo. Uh, do you think that? adoption of proprietary cloud-based services uh, is in some way a risk for the future of open source, not only, not only in terms of technology, but also in the ethical terms around it. I think so, yes. Um, like I, I strongly believe in, in open source and, and, the, and the benefits that it brings in terms of being able to control your own code, your own data, being part of something larger. And sometimes it's sad to see how many people flock to proprietary solutions like a contentful or a content stack, you know? It's like all of a sudden they forgot about open source or they forget that contentful and content stack is a proprietary SaaS platform, you know? It's the exact opposite <laughs> of open source. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a bit strange sometimes how developers um, kind of forget about it at times and, and kind of, go with the easy path, you know? Like there's real value in contributing and using Drupal. Maybe sometimes it's a little bit harder because you have to manage your updates and upgrades yourself. But I believe it's worth it because of all the benefits that come with open source. Um, so I do think these proprietary cloud-based services, especially cloud-based services, I do think they've taken some some momentum away from open source. And uh, it's funny because open source was started as a renegade movement, a movement against proprietary software. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and it has grown into much more and now everybody uses open source. Um, but it's like all of a sudden the pendulum has kind of swung back a little bit, I guess. I never <laughs> feel good about using proprietary services again, which which doesn't always make sense to an old, an old timer in open source like me, you know. So maybe we need to, we need to bring back some of the tactics that we used twenty years ago to explain why open source is better. Um, but it also means, I think, to go back to the previous question from Luca, I think it was. I forgot, but we need to make sure Drupal is easy to use in the cloud, because you can have Drupal in the cloud and and have the best of both worlds, you know? Because the yeah. only advantage of a cloud-based service is that they make it easy to do upgrades. You don't you don't have to do upgrades. But if we can make upgrades easy, then we make it super easy to run Drupal in the cloud, uh, which is, you know, what some of us are trying to do with our companies. <laughs> you can have open source in the cloud, you know? Like for example, Acquia, offers Drupal in the cloud, but you can download everything. Like, it's not like <laughs> you can, you have access to your code and data, you know? So anyway, it's a, it's a great question and a big topic, I think. And, yeah. and maybe we need to create some more awareness that, hey, let's not forget the services that you are flocking to, they're proprietary services, you know? Yeah. Although they rely on open source software, but, uh... Yeah, the, 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 sure. the platform is proprietary. Right. Um, 
I think we can also talk about uh, uh, another cloud-based service, which is GitLab. Um, mm -hmm. So what about the, the collaboration with GitLab? Um, when will the full switch to, to GitLab happen? Yep. Yeah, so it's a great question. So maybe to summarize where we're at. So, you know, Drupal has built one of the most amazing uh, developer platforms and collaboration platforms in the world. You know, like we managed to build software that allows 10,000 plus people to work together on building Drupal. And all of this was homegrown, which in many ways is fantastic. And, and we developed it in ways that were that nobody else was doing like the way we do test driven development and you know all the tests have to pass before we can you know incorporate a patch or a change into drupal like the way we do things it's state of the art first of all i want to be clear like like it's better than 99 percent of the organizations in the world you know our our, our culture of building robust software now having said that um we, we kind of built our own GitHub or GitLab before GitHub and GitLab were born. Yeah, like, I remember it. It did not exist. <laughs> and of yeah. course, um, GitLab and GitLab have come around and have built something very similar to what we use on Drupal at Oregon. In many ways, better too, you know? And so yeah. um, more e easier to use, great innovations in GitLab that we don't have on Drupal at Oregon as well. Uh, so we've been working very closely with GitLab to to move our own homegrown tools to GitLab. And it's been a project that's been going on for for quite a few years because first of all, there was a lot of things GitLab didn't do that we do <laughs> and that we need to to operate at the scale of Drupal. You know, and that may sound funny, but like GitLab wasn't ready for a project the size of Drupal. Uh, and it was missing very important features that we heavily rely on. Uh, so GitLab has really stepped in and added features that we asked them to add. Uh, and we've helped build some of these features too. And we are in the progress of migrating um, you know, to GitLab now. Um, we've already released some parts of it. Um, like we can support merge requests, for example, right now. Uh, and we continue to roll out kind of we continue to deepen that integration and, and uh, then, you know, next steps are like moving issue queues from our own issue queues to GitLab issue queues. Another next step is to um, embrace their CI CD pipeline uh, instead of our own test uh, testing pipeline. Uh, that's exciting because it will allow us to test against more databases and more versions of PHP and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's also exciting because we get some of the ability to automate things more like um, code style checking, accessibility checking, we'll be able to build that into the pipeline and that will reduce the patch review or merge request review times, um, th those kinds of things. But they're all coming. The way we're rolling them out is, you know, every month or every quarter, we release some more integrations uh, until we're completely done. Our goal is to use GitLab uh, you know, to use everything GitLab. <laughs> um, but it takes a little bit of time because we have to figure out how to migrate everything. For example, yeah, right now there's a <clears throat> conversation about the credit system that we have in Drupal. You, you might be familiar, but uh, we, as a Drupal project, we, you know, we let the open source world with, with this. No, nobody has this or had this. And GitLab is quite interested in incorporating this in GitLab to enable every open source project in the world to have a credit system. So we're working with them like, all right, how do we bring the credit system over into GitLab? And also we have to evolve it a little bit because the way GitLab works, uh, we can't just do a very straight port of the credit system to GitLab. We have to rethink a few things. Um, and that takes a little bit of time, you know? Oh, these things aren't yeah. necessarily easy. Plus, we have a lot of data. Remember, we have like over 15 years of data. We have, I think, maybe 40 to 50,000 projects. We have hundreds of thousands of issues. <laughs> um, we have very complex release management tools. We also have to think about 
things like budgets, like if everyone in the Drupal community starts running tests uh, on, you know, 30 different uh, configurations, like we, we would end up paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in testing infrastructure. So we have to yeah. think about how do we build in some limitations, you know, some sort of like, anyway, so a lot of these things we're figuring out. And because of that, we don't have a very specific roadmap. Like I can't tell you exactly when we'll be done because some of these things we, we're, we're using kind of an agile process to figure it out. But I can tell you we have a couple of people working on this full time. That's their only job, you know, at the Drupal Association. It's their only job to get this done. And they use this incremental process of adding features and releasing features to, to the community. It's very exciting, I think. And by the way, yeah we are hosting GitLab ourselves. So it's um, not a, we're not using a proprietary cloud service. <laughs> yeah. And so you're also not afraid of losing ownership and control? No, because GitLab is open source. We have yeah. access to the code and we run the code ourselves on our own servers. So we can make changes to it, you know? Um, yeah. And, and we are making changes to it and we're trying to contribute those changes back and their engineers are helping us too uh, on, on different things. So it's great. It's the way you should yeah. do things. Yeah, that's the beauty of open source. Um, and, and I have a question that links to this one uh, from, from what we collected. Um, I, saw, I see the commits report on each Drupal users profile was recently removed. Maybe uh, the intention is to outsource commits counting to GitLab for Drupal. Uh, so what strategies and functionalities under, are on the horizon to attract, highlight, and maybe reward the contribution in the Drupal code base, on Drupal code base and that of its modules? Right. Um, so I don't know about the specifics. I think, yeah, if we removed some things, it's probably in preparation of introducing well, something else, yeah. right, because of GitLab. Um, but the biggest thing I think we can do right now is make contribution easier. And GitLab is a big part of that um, because we can adopt modern best practices. Like most people have contributed to something <laughs> either on GitHub or GitLab. So they're familiar with that process of contribution. Uh, and so by adopting GitLab, we'll provide more familiar tools. And then by adopting GitLab, as I mentioned, we can have these automations instead of having to wait for a reviewer to show up, GitLab can notify code owners and tell them about a merge request and that will hopefully speed up the review process. Instead of having to manually do code style reviews and going back and forth, nitpicking little code style issues over weeks, we now we will have a tool to automate code style reviews. And so if you contribute, you instantly get feedback. You'll get feedback within you know five or 10 minutes about yeah. all the code style issues you need to fix. Um, so that will make contribution faster and easier. So in a way, I talked a little bit with Angie Byron about this too. And uh, But like, if you think about it, you contribute something and eventually gets committed. You know, let's say right now, often it's months or weeks, sometimes years. <laughs> like, and for small things, that's not okay. Like if you want to make a, a trivial contribution, a relatively easy contribution. So we need to obsess about how do we shrink the time period so that you, like the goal should be you contribute something today on Wednesday, you know, by Monday it is committed and part of the next Drupal release, you know? And so we have to look at all these things and GitLab will be a powerful tool to, you know, to optimize uh, that that workflow, that, that contribution flow. And if we do that, I think we'll be able to attract many more people uh, to Drupal uh, to contribute to Drupal. So that's that's our biggest strategy right now. Yeah. I think I can ask one last question. Uh, it's from the chat. Uh, Massimo uh, talked about Drupal 7 and uh, why Drupal 7 is so hard to die. Uh, like uh, what, what is missing in Drupal 8 and Drupal 9, maybe 10, mm -hmm. that is enabled to attract many Drupal 7 developers? Yeah, great question. Um, I think it's, I don't think it's a, I don't think anything is a missing in terms of um, features other than maybe 
uh, a seamless upgrade path. Hmm. You know, when I talk to Drupal 7 users, um, they, they just don't have the budget to upgrade. And I, I talked a little bit about this in the Dries notes in Prague last week, but um, and you should watch the video recording. I'll try to publish it today, but um, on my site. But I talked to small nonprofits and they built their Drupal 7 site, for example, uh, 10 years ago or eight years ago. And um, I don't know, they spent 30,000 euros, which was a lot of money for a small nonprofit. And in their minds, and, and they did a, a complex website. It might have been Drupal integrated with CVCRM, so it manages their their member base and their nonprofit fundraising efforts. So it's not just a website, but it's Drupal is like this this tool that they use to run their operation. Um, and when when they when they get quotes for upgrading from Drupal seven to Drupal nine, it will cost them you know thirty forty thousand euros again. Yeah, and that they just don't have that budget. They can afford it, and and so <laughs> that's the biggest hurdle. I think it's people don't have the budget to upgrade because the upgrade is complex and expensive, which is why we changed the way we work with Drupal 8 and Drupal 9. So now we have easy upgrades that are very affordable or, or you know, much, much, much more affordable. Um, so that's the cha challenge. And so if we say Drupal 7 is end of life, we don't support it anymore. That still wouldn't make those organizations upgrade. Yeah, like, it doesn't matter what we say. <laughs> you know? So you think uh, lots of them would stay with Drupal seven until they have the budget? Yeah, yeah. And and some of them are saving up so they can eventually upgrade. Um, so, you know, um, that's why I think it's important that we keep supporting Drupal seven as best as we can, and and we are. Um, you know, we try to. You know fix every security bug that comes in, et cetera, so that those organizations are not completely lost. And then slowly but steadily, the upgrade path is also still getting better a little bit, you know, but there is only so much we can do because of the changes we've made. So that's a little bit the situation that we're in. And of course, going forward, we'll never go back to that world, you know, that upgrade from seven to eight or seven to nine and seven to 10 will be the last hard upgrade ever. Yeah. So, but do you also think there are uh, kind of misconceptions about uh, uh, Drupal eight or 10 are too difficult for like a, a, a build, a site builder, uh, Drupal seven is easier. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I see many, many users, many developers, not many developers, many, many designers, let, mm -hmm. let's call them designers, uh, complain about uh, uh, having to use Composer or maybe they right. think that the architecture of the 8, 9, 10 are more complex than 7. So do you think yes. maybe this is a, some misconception? Um, yes and no. I think there's truth to it for sure. Like Composer is more difficult. Um, the Composer is also more flexible and powerful, right? Yeah. And with Project Browser and automatic updates, we're trying to make that easier than ever. And like, if we're successful with Project Browser, and if we're successful with automatic updates, um, you know, updating Drupal will actually be easier than, up, you know, updating Drupal 10 <laughs> will be easier than up, updating Drupal 7. So, you know, yes, Drupal 8 got more complex and it, Drupal 9, uh, I think is easier than Drupal 8. Drupal 10 will be easier than Drupal 9. So I think in a way like Drupal 8 was sort of peak complexity. Um, and now we're very focused on making it easier again. Now, the flip side is that if you talk to developers, uh, you know, a lot of them say, wow, Drupal 8 is much easier than Drupal 7 because yeah. Drupal 8 uses um, common design patterns, you know, that, they're, that developers have been taught in school or that they know from using other frameworks, whether it's Java frameworks or JavaScript frameworks or Ruby on Rails, like it is a little bit more aligned with those kind of platforms and how they work. And so that's a good thing, um, you know? And so, but that that's at the same time hard for people that are uh, self-taught, that, that, that learned programming through Drupal 
like Drupal was their first and only programming experience, then then for them, that's hard. <laughs> but if you have yeah. been professionally trained, I think there's a lot of common design patterns in Drupal 9 um, and, and, and Drupal 10 that will make it easier too, you know? So it's a bit of a nuanced answer, I would say. There's There's no denying that certain parts got a lot harder, but then other parts yeah. got easier. And now we're also on a path to make things simpler again for, uh, you know, what you call designers or, or you know, or site builders. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Dries. And, uh, do you have some final uh, thoughts you want to share with the Italian community? Well, I love Italy. I'd love to come back. I'd love to meet you in person one day. Um, and I would encourage you to contribute to Drupal, you know, like uh, now is a great time. There's a lot of things we have to do and can do. And uh, I would uh, I would encourage all of you to consider not only using Drupal, but also becoming uh, active contributors to the project. So, and if you already contribute, uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and hope to see you in the future. Yeah. I hope we will see maybe in a live event in Italy someday. Yes, invite me. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Thank All you, Dries. Right, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.